Please, as you wish, get up while we're talking. I don't care. It's fine. I probably won't make fun of you if you do that. Probably. Maybe. All right. Uh, you know, only one quick announcement because I'll forget if I wait till the end. Uh, next Sunday, uh, I'll be down in Sarita. Pastor Clemens will be here. Yay! Um, he will be here and we'll be talking about the Apocrypha. Anybody want to raise their hand and say, I don't know what that is? Okay. There are some that don't know what that is. There are many that have some familiarity. If you've been around uh, church a while or if you have uh, friends, relatives who are Catholic, you may know what the Apocrypha is, but uh, you may not know it well. Uh, I'd be surprised if anybody knew it really well. Um, so he's going to talk about that, and uh, we'll see how much he gets through in one session. <clears throat> so, yeah. Again, uh, I'll just thank you for your patience as we kind of go through this time where we don't have the consistency in here that we normally do. But it's a blessing because Pastor Sophie gets to be here to teach. You get to hear from him and also Pastor Clemens. And so thank you for that. All right, I don't think there are any other announcements unless you've got something, some burning thing that must be talked about. I will mention it in there, but I'll mention it here too because we don't want anybody missing it. The call meeting. Next Sunday has been moved to Sarita. Two o'clock Sarita. Okay? So don't show up here. Unless you come really early and can still get down there. All right? Yeah, you can eat lunch here and then go there. That works. All right, let's begin our study with prayer. Lord Jesus, through the pages of your holy word, we look in on the last meal you shared with your disciples, and we are in awe of your love willingness to serve sinful human beings. Help us to trust your sacrifice for salvation and to live the example you set. Amen. All right. Jesus' last day is Holy Week, Thursday, part three. Part one, just as a reminder, where, where we've been and where we're going. Part one, we looked at the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, the two festivals that became combined into one week-long um, thing. That's important. As we're going forward here, it's important to keep that in mind because of some of the references that are made to the day of preparation. So just kind of file that away again. Um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover became a week-long event. Uh, so we talked about that. We talked about the supper itself and the elements uh, of the supper in part one. But also recalling that we don't know for certain exactly how the meal was practiced, um, how many cups of wine. I mean, you can go through that. There are opinions, there are commentaries, but there are slight variations depending on, on who you're listening to. Um, and then we walked through Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just uh, what happened on those days in a very brief way. And we looked at the Messianic Psalms that talked about it. In part two, we went to... The Gospel of John. How can you forget? We spent some time in the Gospel of John. Um, because John handles it very differently. He doesn't give all the details of the meal, for instance. That's going to become important as we're going through this section. Um, but we are going to see a John reference in here. Uh, but he handles it just differently. And you're going to notice when we look at the Gospel accounts that talk about the Supper uh, and some of these events, um, John doesn't cover everything. Um, the other guys do. So, uh, with that, we are on part three, and we're talking about Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. That's just the intro. You've seen it before, yes? It's world famous. You can see the, uh, see the time when he did it. Did you know it was on a wall? Or did you think it was a picture? Yeah. It's on a wall. Uh, you can see where it's at in the monastery. It's in the cafeteria, the refectory, the cafeteria. So, uh, kind of cool, <clears throat> when you look at it, when you look at the room, um, it, it's the dining hall, and then at the end is this painting. So if you can envision that, everybody's sitting at their tables, and Jesus sitting with his disciples at the table. That's awesome. Kind of interesting, huh? Yeah. yeah. They didn't necessarily all sit on the Oh, hang on! Yeah. Hold on, sister! Hang on. 
<laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. The painting, the painting. Um, so uh, I did not know that much about uh, Da Vinci's Last Supper, other than that it's wrong, which you're pointing out. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about it not just because, um, oh, that's cool, um, but there's some reasons why we would want to know how it was. And it's going to reveal some things, I think, that you may or may not have known before. Uh, interesting about his the, the painting of The Last Supper, though, uh, it started deteriorating because of the way he did it. It started deteriorating almost immediately. And if, uh, if you were to see it today, it's been you know, redone. There's almost nothing left of the original, which seems kind of sad if you like art and history and, and that kind of thing. Um, but it's been restored. And the picture below it <clears throat> gives it some color and some clarity uh, that may not be there up above. Um, and names of the individuals, because Leonardo da Vinci had notebooks. Ooh. Yeah. And so, so we know what his intention was, which is kind of cool. Puts you in the mind of the artist, Sandy. This is good. Because it's hard to be in the mind of an artist sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> Russ, is it hard to live with an artist? <laughs> uh, so that's, that's kind of neat. Uh, also, do you know the moment that he is uh, revealing there in his painting? Or can you tell? Yes. Surely? Judas is there, so it's got to be before he announced. Okay, Bill? It's when he announced that uh, one of you will betray me. Yeah. Yeah. So now look at the expressions and the motions of the of the people in the painting. So this is the moment where he he says that one of you is going to betray me, and that well we're going to be looking at that, and so yeah, uh, it's fitting in that way too. But this was his way of of representing that. Um, the picture on the upper right is just there to show you scale. That's a guy standing there below it. And uh, again, if you like art and history and preservation and all those kind of things, um, you're probably not happy that they cut a doorway in the middle of this <laughs> painting. But that's what happened. He didn't paint around it, they cut it anymore. <laughs> How were the disciples seated around Jesus at the table as they celebrated the Passover, as Jesus taught them and prayed for them, which we covered in John 3, as he washed their feet, as he instituted the Lord's Supper? That's the question that we're the questions that we're asking. How, how, were they, how were they seated around there, and can we tell? Um, on the right bottom picture, you have a picture of the triclinium. <coughs> What's that look like? Describe what you see, if you can see it. What's that? A horseshoe-shaped table, yes. And? So you've got the table set then with stuff, so all the stuff will go on the table. What's around the table? Couches. If there are three sides, there would be how many couches? Three. Yeah, don't overthink it. Three couches around the three sides of the table, which is why it's called a triclinium. Three couches. That's the Roman name. Why do we think? Why do we think that they may have, probably did, eat the Last Supper and celebrate the Passover on a table like this? Why would we think? What? It was the custom. It was the custom. Why was it the custom in Israel? The Romans brought it. Because of Roman rule. The Romans ruled. It was what everybody did. It was the way you ate. It's, you can find it. Yes. When in Rome or when in Israel under Rome. Um, yeah, that, that's the way that they would eat a supper. But we're going to see if that makes some sense as we read the accounts of the Last Supper and the, and the Last Passover. See if it makes some sense. So basically you've got uh, the three, the horseshoe shaped, the three sides, and people would be lying on the couches. Uh, some of you might know how that was done. Any description of how they did that? How they ate? Anybody know? That they spilled a lot. That they spilled a lot. <laughs> you know, it makes you wonder about things like this because we don't eat that way. Uh, but they probably got good at it. All right, important thing. Head toward the table where the food is and feet out on the back. So they're lying down. 
reclining, it's actually in there. Which side does it matter what they do? Anybody know? Right hander or left hander? No, you did not get your choice. How many left handers here? <laughs> yeah, they don't want to admit it. <laughs> what have you been through, left handers? <laughs> Three of them. Three left handers. Um, if, yeah, if you're left handed, tough luck. Eat with your right hand. Lean on the left, eat with the right. Because this was the sinister hand. It was the sinister hand. What? Too bad, you learned to eat with your right. Because you can't mess up the table. And you wouldn't be able to talk to each other the way they did it. Uh, so, picture, picture them lying. Turn the page real quickly, and then we're going to turn back. Look on page two. See that diagonal? They'd be lying on the diagonal, on the left, on the left uh, thing like this, and then eating with the right hand. And then lying around the table. I know, it's weird, huh? It's strange. Turn back to page one. It's homish. Yeah. It's weird. Um, so, what's that? Yeah, they were used to it. It was totally their custom. It's just the way they ate. It's what they did. Um, do you remember? Yeah, question. If their feet, if you're laying like this, then there must, be, must have been quite a big space between them. Because your legs are... We'll see if we can figure anything out. There is something in that regard in the Gospel account, too. So, hold that thought. Uh, so, this is the way they ate. Uh, do you remember, do you recall the Passover, the, uh, when they initially celebrated the Passover meal? Do you remember some of the instructions given about that? Stand up, have the shoes on, have your sandals on, right? Have your Nikes on. And what were they? To, what, have your staff in your hand. Staff in the hand. Belt around the leg. Belt around, book tucked ready in. To ready, ready to go. Ready to go. In a hurry. Because it is the Lord's Passover. Right. That's the way God said to eat. At this time, when Jesus lived, do you know who stood to eat? Some someone stood to eat. Some people stood to eat. Do you know who? <laughs> the, tenth, the tenth person in the family because there were nine places to live. <laughs> slaves. Slaves stood to eat at this time, at the time of Jesus. What was the Passover celebrating? Release from slavery in Egypt. This was not lost on the rabbis. We're celebrating a release from slavery. We're not going to eat the meal celebrating the release from slavery, standing here eating like a slave, staff in hand, sandals on the feet, cloak tucked in the robe. They'll eat according to the custom. So, because of the rabbis, we're pretty sure this is the way that they ate. Okay? Yeah, in spite of what... This is what sounds weird, Komish, to me, is... God says, do it this way, do it this way, do it this way. Very much spelled out, you're supposed to do it. But over the years, over the generations, 1,500 years or so, right? Things changed. They altered things without God coming down and smiting them. And sometimes you get the idea in the Old Testament that God would just come down and smite you. you. And there were some times when he did. But... This change was made. There are different changes to the meal. And that's why there's a little bit of uncertainty. How many cups of wine and all that stuff. It was basically the same celebration, um, but maybe not in the meticulous uh, fashion that God originally uh, laid out for them. So, probably, most likely, in this kind of arrangement for, for eating. Jake? So then, because he followed the law perfectly, wouldn't should Christ have been standing at this point? Was he standing here again? This was a, that's a good question. If Jesus was perfect, why didn't he do it exactly like they said at the very beginning? Lord of the Sabbath is all I can say. What was it? What? No, no, you bring up a good question. The same question was brought right when the disciples picked the heads of grain on the Sabbath. And what was Jesus' answer? 
Sabbath is not the Lord of the I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I'll, I make the rules. Um, also, that, that festival description is, is not like the Ten Commandments. It was an event and a remembrance. So perhaps it was seen differently. Apparently seen differently. So that's the, that's the best answer I think we have on that. But it, but it occurs, go on. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah, you got shapes. I put shapes in there. See, I told you to turn back. What are you doing there? Turn back. Turn back. Turn back. There you go. There are some shapes on your triclinium. There are some shapes. Uh, because you have to know that there was a kind of a hierarchy. There, was a, there were places of importance at these tables, always. The host was the, uh, like the fat plus sign or the cross of some kind. That's the host, okay? Number two, I, I used a heart for number two. What, why, did, yeah, I made this up, so. <laughs> Don't tell me who, but um, why a heart, do you think? If the host is there, then who's? No, uh, well, yes, yes. Yeah, it's your best bud. It's uh, it's actually more than that, even. It's even, it's what? No, it's not the one being honored. That's what I heard, even though that's not what she said. That's not what Sandy said. It's, it's the trusted one. It's the, now why, think through the arrangement for a second. Why is it the trusted one? The, the right hand man, so to speak. Could this be a spouse, or do women not join? Well, not at this, not at this particular table with the disciples, um, but I think that normally they would in a family. I don't know, I, I, didn't, come, I didn't come across that, because this position, uh, has a different, um, there's a different reason for this position. I would think kings had the right hand man, the, the one they trusted, the one that they advised them. Uh huh. Very important position. You are right about that. It's the locus consularis. <laughs> yeah, it's the place for the consul, the right hand man. The Gary, what were you going to say? I was, I was wondering if they had anything to do with protection, too. Yes, I was going to say bodyguard. Power. Yeah, sort of. Why would you need somebody there? Does it make sense when you look at the arrangement? You were exposed to the outside. Yeah, so if the, the room is here, uh, well, here we have it. Here we have the, uh, we have the triclinium here. Pretend there's a table here. <laughs> Jerry is the host. Gisela, the right-hand woman. Yeah, she's protecting me. Yeah, Because if they try to attack me, they'll get her. Right. She'll take care of it. She'll take care of it. And the locus consularis would be the guy that if a message came for the host, the locus consularis would receive it. Pass it on. Can you imagine this happening in a movie? Or have you seen a, a Roman movie or something where something like this goes on? There's the protector. That's where they would sit. Oh my God! Trust it. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely could talk, which is hugely important in uh, in this account as we go forward. So that's that's the uh, locus consularis. That's that's why the heart. Someone devoted, uh, and then you have the host, and then you have the star. The star is. <laughs> The honor, the seat of honor. The seat of honor, the, the honored guest sits in the star position. So you have those three. The uh, informer, the protector, then the host, then the guest of honor, and then people would go all the way around to the end, and I didn't have a good shape that went with this position, so I just threw that thing in there. Uh, that person is the servant. If anybody's at the table is going to be helping to serve at all, that's the position they take. And they're at the end also. That makes some sense? They can grab wine. Yeah. So again, that one might be important for our running through the scriptural account also. Question or comment about the triclinium? 
Yes. So it's, yep. Okay, so the knee are reclining on the left elbow, and then the heart is clear at the end. He has to turn around and talk to the next guy. It's not too convenient to talk that way. To us, it doesn't seem very convenient. Uh, I, I've also read. I've also read that. Uh, yeah, this is going to be great. Uh, <coughs> I don't have a good place to recline. So we're picturing this, and to eat, this is what you would do. But I also heard that leaning forward, which makes sense if you're talking to everyone, right? And then to eat, I'm like this. I can talk to this person, but their, their head's facing the other way if we're all eating, right? It's, in, it's not the way we do it, so it just is weird to us. Is that my? No, that's not. So they didn't know how to set it at a table. <laughs> as far as I know. Yeah. Uh, but the conversation is the one thing you didn't talk about. But the other is, if he's a protector, he's out there to see who's coming. Yes. Absolutely. He's right there, and he's looking out. Yep. Which, well, we'll see. We'll see if, uh, so turn, turn the page real quick. Yeah. They're reclining. That's the way they did it in those days. Why does Da Vinci have him sitting? Because Da Vinci was wrong. <laughs> well, he wanted to he wanted to show the expression and the movement and everything of that moment when Jesus says, "One of you will betray me," and they're and and if in art that wouldn't show so well. This is after also this is for, that's why. Also, it's uh, it's in a cafeteria where you're looking to see everybody. And then artists kind of do what they do. Throw that in there too. This is after the Yes. So don't don't trust Da Vinci. So three questions, top of page two. Uh, these are these are my questions about this. Can we learn where certain disciples were seated at the table? Are we able to figure that out? What can we learn about Jesus and the disciples if we can? Will this help us to understand the Gospels in a way we haven't before? Those I, those, I think, are the important questions. You may have another important question. What? That's the question. What Which one? Is whether, you can help us, whether you can help us understand <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, that, that is a question. <laughs> well, I feel veins in, so I think I got something. We'll, we'll see what you think. Um, Matthew 26, 20 through 25. Now, I didn't include Mark's gospel account here. It is almost identical to Matthew's account right here. So uh, you have Matthew and Mark really saying this. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. Um, I'm going to give you a few minutes. I, I want, I want, uh, rather than just throwing things out there and that, I want you to investigate those verses. Come up with key words and phrases. I came up with four. Um, four words or phrases or verses that I thought were important to the discussion. And not everything that you find interesting in there. That's not what we want to know. We want to know four things that speak about the positioning at the table and, and um, yeah, that. I won't say any more. See if you can come up with four verses or four words to talk about their positioning at the table that are important for this discussion. You can talk with each other, that's fine. You can read the notes in the bottom of your Bible pages, whatever you, whatever you need to do, and then we'll reconvene in a few minutes here.
Now, this is what people have, have noticed uh, about the arrangement and about where they're sitting. But we're, we're going to go we're gonna go a little deeper than, oh, they were just sitting here. Okay? We'll, we'll go for meaning uh, as we go along. So Judas has got to be next to him if he's going to dip his hand in the bowl at the same time. He's got to be, he's got to be right there. Uh, what else did you have? Steph? In verse 25, when Judas actually talks to Jesus, he had to be, because you kind of got the impression that the rest of the disciples didn't know really what was going on, that he had to be close and could talk to Jesus a little bit more privately. Okay. Uh, that's an important thing. Some of these thoughts we're going to be revisiting as we look at the next section, too. That one in particular is going to come into play. Um, you get the feel, maybe, because nothing else is said, um, that with verse 25, that maybe nobody else heard this. Maybe it was a private conversation. If he's got to be close to dip his hand in the bowl at the same time, and if he's speaking to him, it seems like we're narrowing down that Judas has got to be next to Jesus. <laughs> I, I was also looking that it might mean that he's really close because the other <coughs> it's recorded as surely not I, Lord, and that is surely not I, Rabbi. That he's closer to him than something about that. That word may mean a little difference. There is a difference, right? I uh, wanted to know, surely not I, Lord. It's hard to say, but you do notice that he says, surely not I, Rabbi. <coughs> teacher. Teacher. Yeah. Teacher. Uh, maybe there's a distinction to be seen. Maybe the top one is capturing just the overall thought, surely not I. Maybe they all didn't say exactly that phrase. Maybe it was, yeah. oh no, it can't be me. It, you know. But you notice that there seems to be a difference. Nancy. <coughs> We thought maybe he was even all the way at the end because it must have been relatively quiet because he just made this statement that had everybody going, oh my gosh, it can't be me. So we think, we were thinking maybe for him to say something to Judas that everybody wouldn't go and say, oh my gosh, it's Judas, he's the one. That he was maybe the one on the end. Okay, so on the end. Um, where, do you, where do you think Jesus probably sat? We'll ask that right now. Ron? Uh-huh. Right. That, that conversation is going to come up as we talk about this. About the, the yeah, he talked about positions at a banquet. Mm -hmm. But where do you think Jesus sat? In the heart. I Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Where do you think Jesus? What? The cross. The cross, the host. Almost everyone believes that writes about such things that Jesus was in that host position. He's the one that told them, go and prepare a place. He was the one teaching. He was the one speaking, serving as the rabbi. He would have probably been recounting the details of the Passover. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He was the one who washed everybody's feet. He did. He acted as a servant in that, so it would make more sense if he was over here. At I don't know if it makes more sense, but you could make a case. In fact, Brandy just brought that up also. So the question is out there, should we be placing Jesus in that lone position across the way? So hold, hold that in your mind. Um, but most people, most people, because of the other stuff that we're going to read, um, believe that Jesus would have been the host of position. Okay. So sit in the center, like this is the picture. No. no. The, the center? No? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The, okay. the middle of those yeah. three symbols, right. yes. Right. Yep. I want to know how John could lean against... Whoa! Have we heard that yet? <laughs> have we run across that verse yet? No. Well, you can't run ahead. <laughs> you can't run ahead. Hang on. We're coming there, though. That's like critical to this conversation. Yes, yeah. So stay with what's there and not just what you know, because it's all going to come rounded out, maybe. Um, anything else in the Matthew and also Mark account of time? So the part that says he would be, it would be better if Judas had never been born, because Matthew says that he was his reputation is eternal almost, too, and it's almost an insult to call somebody a Judas. And so I think that, you know, if you hadn't been born, you wouldn't have had to go through this, and people wouldn't have this eternal reputation about you. It doesn't speak to the seating, but no, more to but Judas as a... 
individual. Okay. Russ? I can't remember anywhere in the New Testament where Jesus rose his voice, where he talked, screamed, or said, I want your attention. When, when he said, listen, you know, I tell you the truth, it was like we're talking right now. Can you well, maybe. Can you imagine how soft the voice you just like an aside? Yeah, that's what we think. That's what we think. We'll see if we still think that in John's account, but, but that's what we think, that it was he was able to speak privately. Eric. The one thing that I, I think about is that they spoke to him one after the other, and it appeared that even though this is a major thing as it's been depicted in the picture, that it was still very orderly. That everything that Jesus was involved with here, that there was an order to it, and it was they were speaking in an orderly fashion. They weren't just yelling out. You mean like we are? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like this crowd. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 hard to uh, it's interesting to, but hard to put ourselves at the table. What exactly what was it like? And we're trying. We're trying. Um, some, some of it we read between the lines, and we may take a different way. Like, Russ, I, I think that Jesus did raise his voice on occasion. I think when he cleared the temple, he was loud. Normal discourse, the image I have of him is not as much. And yet, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, your Pharisees and teachers of the law. Sounds like a yell. In my head, but I wasn't there. So it, we tried. We tried to implant ourselves. Joyce? We'll come to that. We, we will come to that. That's a, a servant role. It's something that happened here, and it may move us, move Jesus across the table to the servant position. We'll see. Anything else in Matthew's words? Yep. Judas was going to dip his hand in the bowl with Jesus. He had to be sitting very close to him. Otherwise, he would have had to reach around other people. Yeah, exactly. So he's got to be close. He's got to be right, right next to him. One place or the other. So if, if you're putting Jesus in the host position, where is Judas? In the heart. The heart is the star. Yeah, let's use the symbols. He's either he's either the heart or the star. Does either one of those surprise you? No. Yes, no, both. I got all sorts of answers. In my mind, both would be surprising. Really? Judas is going to be Jesus' protector. He did keep the money. So, you know, Bernice, you're smart. You bring up a good point. Some... And some people suggest that Judas was on the outside because he's the guy with the money. If something had to be paid for, taken care of, he would be that guy. Knowing what you know of the locus consularis, do you want him there? What, what, if, what if the guards come in now? Yeah. <laughs> Honey, that's not the kind of bodyguard you want. Um, yeah. But at this time, we don't know that about Judas. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, we do. Okay. Yep, yeah, we do. Yeah. We do. But yeah. we know that Judas left before everybody else, so doesn't that, that that's mean coming. that he'd be on the outside? That's coming. No, you could still get out if you had to. Oh, okay. You still well, that's that. That's that. That's it could also be that he is in the position of honor because he is the keeper of the money. Yes. He is shocking to us. <laughs> shocking to me, anyway. That Judas would be the guest of honor? But Judas wanted to fight. What's that? He wanted this to be a fight. He wanted it to be a physical fight. When? Where? That's the impression I received, and I can't quote it because I'm not a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's full of fun. Uh, I, I don't hear that. In the Bible passages, I'm not coming up with the Bible passage, Bill. I've lost the train of thought that's changing now. <laughs> Think about Judas as the guest of honor, and uh, we're, again, we're 
going to continue to look at the passage as to further cement this, but we got hands flying. Well, if Judas has all the money, he's probably the host. No, no, <laughs> not, not necessarily, not necessarily. Bill's the guest of honor because he's going to be the one that's going to be kicked out, per se, because he was going to betray We'll, we'll see. We're going to look at a little more that speaks of the very same thing. We'll see how John reports it. Uh, and then across the page, we've also got Luke's account. And, uh, and we'll see if we can solidify this. And then we'll go a little deeper and talk about why this might have been or that might have been. Kathy, real quick. Yeah, just, um, I remember it being of cultural significance that we were actually sharing a dish with someone that there's an intimacy in Kind of like Jesus was giving him one last opportunity to... Yeah, that's the stuff we'll talk about. Um, but not next week. Because next week you have to learn about the Apocrypha. And I'm, I'll bet you'll learn some things that you didn't know before, even if you were acquainted with it. Pastor Clemens will be in here. And then we'll resume this the next week.